Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today in our call, we have Joe McKay, the CEO of Kraken Robotics, the CFO of Kraken Robotics. Kraken Robotics trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol PNG and on the OTC under KRNKF. The company is trading at 59 cents with roughly 166 million shares outstanding or about a $98 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andriola. Thanks, Trevor. Um, Joe, uh, great to have you here. Um, we, we've had a number a number of subscribers that have uh, been begging us to get a hold of you guys and uh, do an interview. So um, sure. I'm happy. I'm happy we finally were able to do it. Um, I've known about Kraken for a while, um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of our subscribers haven't. So uh, Joe, why don't you give us a, sort of a, a summary uh, description of uh, what Kraken does? Yeah, for sure. Thanks very much, Paul and Trevor. Um, yeah, Kraken Robotics, uh, we're an underwater uh, robotics company. Um, our uh, CEO, Carl Kenny, he owns uh, roughly about 16% of the company. Got a board, management, and employees own around, uh, you know, combined, including Carl, 16%, own about 34% of the company. And then we also have uh, a strategic investor with uh, Ocean Infinity who owns uh, just around 14% uh, of the company and, and is a key customer of ours. Um, year to date, we've done uh, just over $10 million of revenue. Uh, we are uh, EBITDA break even. Uh, the company started about eight years ago as a sensor company. Uh, now today, uh, we're a full service operator. So it's sensors, uh, batteries, uh, catfish, uh, robotics as a service offerings. Um, we, we serve kind of really two uh, key markets. One is the, the military market. Uh, predominantly, that's the mine hunting space to, you know, to find mines and keep soldiers out of the minefield. And uh, this is that C, obviously. And then uh, the commercial market uh, where we use our tech to survey the seabed. So uh, any, any project that needs uh, high quality imagery data, um, and you wanna survey a pipeline, look for a lost ship, a subsea cable, any infrastructure on the seabed, um, they would use our, our products to do that. Um, recently we've won uh, two contracts, uh, two key contracts, I should say, one with the, the Danish Navy and one with the Polish Navy. Uh, combined, these two contracts uh, have revenue of just over 45 million. Uh, we're providing uh, our catfish and our automated launch and recovery systems uh, to both these two navies. Uh, the Danish contract was a competitive bid process, um, very competitive, and we beat out uh, you know two large uh, defense contractors, uh, one in Northrop, uh, based on obviously the United States, and also Thales, uh, based in, in France. The real exciting thing that's uh, happened to us um, since that point is that uh, we won those two contracts. It's really a lot of uh, other uh, navies have been knocking on our door. Uh, the reason for that is uh, Dan the, the Danish are considered uh, experts in mine hunting. Um, given the location of the country, you can appreciate the number of World War II mines uh, that are located in, in the seas around Denmark. And so uh, once uh, we were selected, uh, uh, you know, all these navies started to take notice and now we're actually uh, talking to 10 to 12 various countries around the world uh, that have approached us looking at for us to do the same thing that we're doing for, uh, for the Danish Navy. And that's really upgrading their technology from old size scan sonar uh, to SAS um, and using, a, you know, our autonomous launch recovery system, which is remotely operated. So the sailor is not out uh, in the minefield and, and is not safe but out of, out of harm's way. So the potential orders on this are between, you know, depends on the country, but it can be one unit or it can be up to uh, 12 units, uh, depending on the country. Um, so for us, this is very exciting. This is going to play out uh, during two, 2021, uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a really exciting part that's uh, kind of uh, splintered off here off of the, the Danish Navy win. Um, also on the sensor side, uh, we've been very excited. We've been working with the U.S. Navy on uh, the foreign, foreign comparative test. Uh, what a foreign comparative test is, it allows the U.S. Navy to reach out to uh, friendly countries uh, like Canada that to acquire technology that can't get in the United States. So in this case, the United States Navy uh, came to us, uh, they're using old size scan sonar and asked us to use, uh, to shrink our SAS to put it on a two-man drone. Um, so it's the same thing as pretty much what Denmark is doing, what Denmark's doing on a larger scale on uh, buying the full catfish. Uh, but the U.S. military is looking at putting our SAS on their, their two-man drone. So we've delivered a, a prototype to them earlier this year. I believe it was Q2, early Q3. Uh, we're delivering another prototype to them here in Q4. And we hope to find out in uh, the early part of 2021 if we have the opportunity to upgrade our uh, up, upgrade uh, 
uh, the, uh, the U.S. Navy to SAS. Um, the opportunity there is 100, 100 plus drones uh, that they have there in service. Uh, so to upgrade those uh, would be a, a large uh, multi-million dollar opportunity for us. Um, and then I would say the kind of leveraging off that, kind of similar to what happened with Denmark, um, on the back of that, we've had a lot of uh, interest in our entire sensor business. So we're seeing increased demand for all of our SAS sensors. And this coming is this coming from uh, vehicle operators that don't compete with us and they need high, high end resolution. Uh, so this is mainly in the two man drone market. And uh, if they don't have a vehicle we compete with, uh, we're open to putting a, uh, allowing to sell SaaS to these guys. So I think early next year and you know, all throughout 2021, you're gonna see a number of orders um, on, the, on the sensor side as well. Uh, the other thing I would say, Paul, that where we're really uh, keeping us busy is uh, the work on our uh, Ocean Vision project. Um, this is a $19 million project that allows us to develop our recurring revenue business. Um, the cost of Kraken is only $4 million over three years. Um, so it provides us with uh, $15 million of uh, non-dilutive uh, R&D. Um, right now, one of the cool things we're working on is a, a hovering AUV. It's called our Thunderfish. We put our SAS sensors on that. It's completely autonomous, but it would hover over an object. And, uh, you know, it could be a mine. It could be an oil leak, uh, whatever you want to see on the seabed floor. But immediately take a 3D model of that. Um, so it's very cool and uh, you know it's rated down to 6,000 meters which is considered the, the bottom of, of the ocean. Um, so we're developing that under under the Ocean Vision project. Um, so far the Ocean Vision project we've delivered a catfish and a layers. Uh, we've done three campaigns off the coast of Newfoundland uh, doing stuff for the oil and gas industry, the fishing industry and, uh, and a utility and the feedback has been really quite amazing and I think you know, that will position us really well uh, to land a number of recurring revenue contracts um, in, in, in 2021. Um, and just on the recurring revenue piece, uh, we get a lot of questions on that, uh, just given some of our quarters are kind of lumpy. Um, you know, we kind of see, you know, before our financing, we kind of saw a recurring revenue piece being around a $30 million uh, business in, in three years. That would be just growing that organically, and that would leverage all the technology coming out of the Ocean Vision project. Um, and then really would be like a, what we call a digital twin, uh, where we would take our Sea Vision project and create a, a virtual digital twin, a 3D model, a 3D image, do stuff like ship haul inspection, offshore, offshore oil and gas stuff, uh, mooring chains, and then also uh, the wind and turbine, the offshore wind and turbine uh, to market. Um, so we're on the back of our financing, you know, we're going to try to accelerate that uh, and bring that closer, not take the through the you know kind of the three years uh, to obviously remove some of that lumpiness uh, in our business. Uh, the other thing I would mention is just our, uh, our subsea batteries. Uh, we made, they're made in our German facility. Um, what's cool about the, these batteries is our gel encapsulation, which can withstand the pressure at 6,000 meters. Uh, because you don't, as a result of that, you don't need, uh, you know, batteries right now, you put them on the bottom of the ocean, they would need a, an oil uh, pressure compensator to withstand the pressure. So now without you using just essentially gel, um, you can uh, put, pack more batteries into uh, the, the customer's uh, AUV. Uh, so we've had one customer who can go four days without charging. Um, you know, we had a large order last year for $9 million from Ocean Infinity. Uh, we sold about another $6 million of batteries into uh, the defense market. And uh, we think the defense market is going to be a key market for us in 2021. And it's been a great acquisition for us. Uh, we've only paid about uh, you know, 2 to $3 million Canadian. Uh, for crack and power a number of years ago. So it's been a great acquisition for us. Um, so I'll wrap up, well, uh, but before I do, I just want to highlight our, uh, you know, our strong balance sheet. Uh, we, as a uh, highlighted, uh, we've uh, completed our $10 million financing recently. Uh, we're going to use that, as I said, to uh, you know, accelerate our recurring uh, revenue piece. Um, also, we've received uh, $9 million in upfront deposits uh, on the Danish and Navy orders. And then we also have uh, another $12 million in non-dilutive government funding. You know, a good chunk of that comes from Ocean Vision, uh, but essentially we can do the R&D. We don't have to go to market uh, to raise funds to do all the R&D. Uh, we've got it through uh, a lot of uh, this, uh, this government funding. So I think we're well positioned uh, for 2021 and uh, be happy to answer any of your questions. Fantastic, thanks Joe. Um, I wanna remind all, all the listeners that if you get any questions, uh, people, uh, please feel free to, to use the chat function and then I'll do my best to ask Joe the questions. 
Um, let, let's dive a little bit more into the technology. Um, I think we probably all have seen sort of uh, submersive uh, robotics before, but what, what makes you guys different? What makes you guys better? And really, um, you know, we've seen sonar images and stuff like that. You, you guys aren't really delivering sonar. You're delivering something quite, quite different. Maybe describe that a little bit. Yeah, so what we, we, what we provide is a, some synthetic aperture sonar, uh, which, which we call uh, SAS. Um, so we believe, you know, it's 15 times better than real aperture sonar, um, area of coverage. It's, a uh, 10 times better than real aperture sonar. Um, you can get a, a 600 meter swath uh, up to four kilometers an hour. And, uh, you can fly off the bottom with our technology. So it's got operational, operational, uh, operational safety. The secret sauce uh, for our, uh, our SAS really, you know, I mean, aperture is just a fancy way of saying antenna. So you see the antenna on the size of our, uh, of our vehicles. Um, our, our, our software uh, makes the antenna and the motion of the vehicle uh, believe it's uh, 10 to 15 times bigger than it is. And so because it thinks it's 10 to 15 times bigger than it is, it has higher quality imagery. And that's really it in a nutshell. Uh, I'm sure the, the engineers would tell you it's a lot more complicated than that. But uh, it's, uh, that's it in a nutshell, using that software, uh, the motion of the vehicle, uh, to create the, the allowing the antenna to believe it's a uh, higher, uh, uh, larger than it is, and it creates that 600 meter swath. There are te other technologies where they could take just as good of a picture, but they'd have to be sitting on the object more or less. And by having that 600 meter swath, you know, you can, you know, if you think if you're in a minefield, obviously you want the sailor to be safe and you don't want to be to get too close to a minefield. You can see that, mo that mine earlier. Um, but if you're in a survey business, if you're like uh, Ocean Infinity, who's, you know, competing on a, a project and, you know, you only want to spend seven days surveying something and they can do uh, a 600 meter swath, uh, they can get done that project a lot more quicker and, and bid it more competitively than other technology where they might have to do, you know, uh, numerous more uh, paths to find whatever they're looking for. Um, so that's, that's really the, in a nutshell, uh, our technology on the SAS side. And on the battery side, it, it's all about the gel encapsulation. Uh, where we uh, acquired a crack in power. Um, the, uh, the CEO of that company, his uh, PhD was uh, developing um, the technology around the gel encapsulation to be able to, the, you know, to, be able to bake that gel to withhold all the pressure at 6,000 meters, you know, considered the bottom of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the ocean. Um, and you touched on a little bit of, uh, you know, what the market is or who your, your customers are. Maybe split up and uh, the, the sort of the, the military side of the business and the non-military side and give us a sense of how big this market opportunity is. Yeah, well, I think all in, you know, we would say that the market in, in about five years is a, is a $5 billion market. Um, and you will be split kind of in five years, right now, it's, a, it's all about uh, the military side of things. Uh, the military would have the big chunk of it, but it, it's going to revert to the commercial having a big chunk of it right now. So right now in the military market, you know, they're producing it for mine countermeasures, uh, surveillance and reconnaissance, uh, anti-submarine warfare. And then we're going to mainly move over to the commercial as the commercial side gets more efficient. You got to understand the technology that these guys, both the military and the commercial guys are using is 20 to 30 years old. It's going, it's going from black and white now to HD, and that's the great opportunity to upgrade this. So, you know, we have an example here in, in Atlantic Canada where a company is paying, you know, $2 million uh, to survey a, a pipeline where it would take, you know, months for them to do it. We can do the project in actually four days. Um, maybe you can get it down to three days, actually, if you really want to try really hard. Um, so, it's, you know, the, the, the commercial side, it's the cable and pipeline market subsea asset stuff, uh, uh, wind farms, that kind of thing. Uh, what we're seeing, uh, because of where we're positioned, um, you have a number of countries in the world, and it's a, it's a bit the same on the commercial market, but we're seeing on, on the military side, you have a number of countries all across the world. They don't have tier one defense budgets. They're not the United States, France, England. Um, so you're seeing a, no a number of countries come forward that you know, with the threats around the world, um, you know, whether it's China, Russia, et cetera, um, or just because you have technology that's 20 to 25 years old and, and you can upgrade now, um, and, and, but you don't have a, a gigantic budget. So it was kind of the same thing with Denmark and, and Poland. Um, you know, Poland came to us just after talking to Denmark 
Um, so they took advantage of you know Denmark being a leader in, in the industry. But there's a number of small you know small country, small countries out there that don't have the tier one defense budgets that are, need to upgrade, and that's kind of our sweet spot. So uh, there'd be NATO countries, but also uh, kind of Southeast Asian uh, countries uh, that would be uh, looking uh, looking for our technology. But the, the market, I think, it, you know, we kind of see it as, as 10 billion uh, in 2025 and around five billion dollar market right now. So um, you mentioned a couple of times that the Danish and Polish Navy as customers, and I think you said $45 million uh, worth of orders from them. What, what time frame do you expect to deliver that? Yeah, so the uh, about 70% uh, of the contract will be delivered in the first uh, 24, 26 months. And then uh, the balance of the contract would be delivered probably over you know three to five years. Um, the Danish Navy contract comes with an acquisition phase. And then there's a sustainment phase. And so once we, we build the equipment, then we have a contract to sustain uh, sustain the, uh, the equipment. Mm -hmm. So uh, the bulk of the contract, uh, 70%, uh, would be in the first 24 or 26 months. Okay. Fantastic. And um, I mean, these are not uh, easy sales. Uh, you, know, you mentioned one that looked like it was an RFP. Um, give us a sense of your sales process and how you go go about trying to you know, land these type of customers. Yeah, it's been a lot of long work. A lot of, uh, you know, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of lead times. I think it really started, you know, when Carl started the, the company about eight years ago and getting out in the market and getting folks to understand what our sensors were all about. And then at one point where they got enough critical mass to have sensors, um, it was made obviously sense to have, we never had a full complete uh, unit until uh, about three years ago when we had the, the catfish. And so I would say that the sales cycle can run on the military side, um, you know, the Denmark sale, it, it probably took two years. Uh, the Polish sale is probably a year. Uh, commercial market, way shorter. The commercial market can call us up today and they'll, they'll, it's a relatively short process and they want the product in three months. Um, so it depends. Uh, you know, obviously, we have a procurement laws, European Union procurement laws uh, uh, that they would, the militaries would have to go through. Uh, same thing here in Canada and, and, and uh, obviously, obviously the United States. Um, so there's definitely some hoops you have to jump through. Uh, but on the commercial side, the lead times are significantly shorter. Mm -hmm. Uh, fantastic. Um, uh, why don't we just dive into this question? I'm going to ask every CEO uh, lately, but uh, COVID, how's, how's COVID affected your operations? And did, is, do you see any, you know, increase in opportunities or decrease in opportunities, uh, you know, going forward? Yeah, we were quite lucky here. We're based in, for those who don't know, we're based in Atlanta, Canada. Uh, COVID never really hit us too hard. Uh, we actually never stopped production um, with employees that could work from home, work from home. Uh, but we took our, our production facility, we broke them into two teams, uh, you know, A team and B team, and they worked uh, split shifts um, seven days a week. And so it didn't have an impact from the production side. Uh, initially, when COVID hit, so we had some uh, suppliers that um, kind of had to shut down initially. It slowed us down kind of seven to 10 days. Um, that was probably the, the largest of it. Uh, we had an instance where we had some batteries we had to get shipped over to the United States. Um, you know, we could, it took a little while to get it shipped over just because all the commercial flights were all canceled and they were taking a lot of the cargo initially. Um, so we took a little while, again, it was a kind of seven to 10 day hiccup. But the, the probably the biggest uh, impact for us is uh, the customers that want to get into Atlanta, Canada, and particularly Nova Scotia to do sea trials. And we have one customer that uh, wants to uh, place an order and they can't get into, they're building their own ships and they can't get into, uh, into Halifax right now because of, uh, you know, you'd have to uh, quarantine for, for, for two weeks. And we're, we're trying to get around that in numerous ways. Um, to a certain extent, uh, they're held up a little bit uh, because of their, uh, you know, COVID affected the construction of their ships. Uh, but uh, that's the biggest impact for us has been, uh, you know, sea trials, uh, you know, doing some stuff with uh, the U.S. military. It was supposed to happen in the first quarter, moved over to uh, January uh, just because of, uh, of uh, restrictions on uh, travel and, uh, and those kinds of things. But it hasn't been terrible. It's been manageable, I would say. Um, but that, that's where the kind of uh, the issues have kind of lied right lately. 
And can you give us a sense of uh, sort of the, the, the price for some of these units? Uh, obviously, you've got different products you're selling, but can, just give us a, a general sense of what these units will sell for. Yeah, on the uh, on the catfish, on the uh, commercial side, uh, the non-military grade would be approximately U.S. Uh, 1.5 million just for the catfish. It would be about another million dollars U.S. Uh, for the launch and recovery system, if you wanted to add that on. Um, and then on the, uh, the military side, if it, uh, a military grade catfish uh, would be about uh, US uh, two and a half million. And then again, another US uh, one million for uh, the launch and recovery system. And then there's also different functions. So it's like anything, it's a, uh, you know, different software, different options. And so that could vary anywhere between a million dollars or $2 million. Um, you know, some, uh, some uh, companies want you know, the launch recovery system made out of different material and others want to, you know, you know, they want to, you know, make their order a little more special to, to what they're doing with it. Um, so those things can add up to, you know, another million or $2 million uh, per sale. But the, the base price is kind of US 1.5 to US 2.5, depending on a military grade or, or non-military grade. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and what, kind of, what kind of margins do you have on these products? Yeah, and if you kind of look at our, our, our Consolidated gross margins are, are going to be anywhere between 45 to 52 uh, percent, depending on uh, the orders. Uh, we had had some orders. You know, Ocean Infinity was a particularly large order. Uh, it was a nine million dollar battery order, and I think the gross margins on that, uh, you know, were a little bit lower than that. Uh, but in, on a general basis, uh, in the in, you know, in the, a non you know large order that you know, we don't have to discount to. Uh, to get her in like that, you would be in the you know, 45 to 50 range, I would say it's a good spot for our margins. Okay, good. And um, can you give us a sense, I don't know if you've, you've posted it, but did you guys uh, announce your backlog? What kind of sort of backlog uh, type of, um, you know, do you have? We, 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 don't, uh, we don't post our backlog, just, you know, we're still kind of growing and growing that backlog. Uh, but obviously, uh, you know the, the the two main the main Danish Navy and Polish Navy would be the forty million plus plus there would be probably another uh, fifteen million on top of that so it would be around the fifty five million range. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, okay, great. And um, the um, you, you talked a bit about the insiders. Uh, looks like uh, combined, you guys got about thirty four percent insider ownership plus another fourteen percent as the strategic. Uh, owner, yeah. um, may, maybe talk a little bit more about how that rolled itself out. I mean, how do you how do you get somebody to, to, to buy in like this, and and how meaningful is that strategic uh, going forward? Well, I think the strategic is is very important going forward. If you, for those who don't know, the strategic is Ocean Infinity. Uh, you, you know, they've uh, they were the ones behind the nine million dollar order last year. Um, they've also bought some uh, some sensors as well for their for their Fugans. Uh, but if you, if you know the, the business landscape, uh, Ocean Infinity right now is putting in place uh, a, fl a fleet called Armada. Um, it's a fully autonomous uh, fleet, so it's a, uh, it's, it's a fleet with no captain. It's all operated remotely. It's all operated remotely, and uh, they're rolling the fleet out with various sizes of ships on all 15. Not all 15 ships will have... Uh, their uh, technology on them, our technology on them, uh, but we're hoping for a significant order from uh, Ocean Infinity uh, next year, and they're actually uh, the, the company that can't get into Atlantic Canada right now to place the order. Okay, gotcha. Um, you also touched on the fact that, you know, you got a healthy balance sheet. Um, do you foresee any need for financing going forward uh, to, to continue the business? No, no, we don't. Uh, right now, we're we're fine. Obviously, we uh, we're going to uh, we complete that financing. You know, with the uh, work. Oh, I should mention all of our orders. All of our large orders come with uh, thirty percent to thirty five percent deposits up front. Um, so that helps on the working capital side. Uh, so we really didn't need to tap the market to actually, you know, to do the Danish Navy and the Polish Navy orders. It was really more to accelerate that recurring revenue business. And so right now, uh, yeah, we're we're fine. Okay, perfect. Um, and then, um, you know, what, what, what keeps you up at night uh, running this business? It seems like it's, there's a lot of moving parts here, but what, what keeps you up at night? Yeah, it's making sure you execute on the growth. Uh, there are a million moving parts, actually. 
Um, you know, it's good and exciting fun, uh, but it's making sure you don't miss anything. And uh, what keeps you up at night is you have to don't, make sure you don't miss anything on these growth opportunities and, and grow too fast that, you know, you, you screw something up. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we did was, you know, I took the CFO role just a little over a year ago and the, the previous CFO, Greg Reed, he moved into the chief operating officer role because we, you know, kind of acknowledged that the company was growing at a, a rapid pace. Um, it is an international, an international company. Um, so that comes with its own risk when you're operating international. And so uh, we made that change uh, so that, uh, you know, we can kind of can, uh, mitigate the, the risk and opportunities of that are out there. So um, that's, that's what I would say is, is making sure we manage that growth properly and, and execute properly. Um, you know, right now in front of us, We've got uh, the Danish order and the Polish order. You know, we, you know, we're making sure, you know, that's very important for us. That's the, that we uh, make sure we execute on, on that order. And um, uh, you've made an acquisition in the past. Do you guys see any other, um, you know, uh, opportunities that, that you'd uh, consider uh, buying? Yeah, I, I think going forward, um, if there is a way for us to accelerate our recurring revenue business, at uh, you know an attractive valuation, I think that's something we would consider, um, and something that was synergistic. Um, you know, there's there's a number of uh, companies out there in the world. Um, some are good, some are bad, and there's a lot of due diligence uh, you have to do, and you can't necessarily travel too far right now because of COVID to do due diligence. Um, so you have to, you know, uh, if there's something out you know, there, short answer I guess would be if there is something out there that was a creative. Um, and uh, made sense to the core business and would accelerate our, our recurring revenue business, we would, we would take a look at it for sure. And, and um, maybe give, give us a sense sort of like um, two to three years out or when your business is a little more mature, what, what sort of percentage would you anticipate would be recurring revenue and, and which would be sort of one-time sale? Is, is there sort of a long-term goal? Yeah, there's definitely a long-term goal to make it uh, at least about 50%. Um, two to three years out, I, I don't know if we'll be quite the 50%. It'd be probably closer to, you know, 35% uh, in that kind of range. But the you know, the recurring revenue model is something that uh, we're looking at very hard. And I think as you get more orders, it's kind of interesting. As you get more orders on the military side, um, so if we get more orders like the Danish Navy side that come with sustained contracts, they're essentially recurring revenue uh, pieces as well, right? Uh, they're always going to come with the 10 to 15 million dollars of sustainment revenue um, on the back end of those contracts. So if you add on a couple of those, a few of those contracts, you're getting some just organically from selling your equipment into the market. Um, you know, we're still early days into you know selling our equipment into the market. We, you know, the company hasn't sold that many catfish, and then now we're we're selling uh, another uh, for our first big chunk here going forward. So it's critical for us to. Uh, make sure that we execute on this part, uh, you know, the construction of, uh, you know, the Danish and Polish Navy uh, opportunities, but also uh, we're cognizant of, uh, you know, increasing that recurring revenue base and uh, whether it's organically or and organically, it's going to happen uh, for sure. Uh, it, and then if we can accelerate that a little bit with uh, over the next near term, but also if, you know, we'll look at uh, acquisitions if, uh, if it makes sense. You guys are based on the uh, east coast of Canada. Um, you are, you know, there's, there's, we know there's plenty of um, sort of technology around, uh, around, around the oceans uh, on that side of the country. But you guys are competing with some pretty big players in the space. You've been pretty successful in competing. G give us a sense of the competitive landscape and uh, how you guys are really, you know, differentiating yourselves from them. Yeah, well, I mean, the, it starts with our SaaS. Um, you know, our SaaS product is second to none than anyone else. Uh, it's second to none in the world. And then if you put in, you know, we're not the, we're not a large defense contractor. We're not going to go in and tell the customer what they're paying. You know? And I think how we compete against in some of these bids is that, you know, some of the large defense contractors are, are going to come in and tell the customer what, try to tell the customer what they're going to, to pay for for that product, and obviously we're coming in at a multiple, probably a little bit lower, a low, lower than that. Um, and for the markets we're targeting, you know, if you look at the Danish Navy and the Polish Navy contracts, 
is it worthwhile for a large defense contractor to reprice their market going down to, you know, for a $40 million opportunity or even a $10 million opportunity. So our, our sweet spot is really being nimble and having, you know, the best product and having probably, you know, the best pricing um, that gives us a large competitive advantage. Um, I think being um, actually located here in, in Atlanta, Canada gives us also another great advantage on the cost side. Um, you know, we're certainly not, uh, uh, you know, paying what uh, would be in the market in the United States or and it's certainly not what would be in the market in Europe. Um, so we have a benefit on the cost side as well. Uh, but we also have, you know, we've got the top uh, chief scientists in the world working for us um, and uh, in the SaaS space. And so uh, nobody else has that. And that means a lot to um, a lot of these customers that know that, you know, we can back up what we're actually you know, say we can do and we can sustain that um, for long periods of time as well. So it's a combination of a bunch of things, but uh, being small, nimble and hungry and uh, um, it, all, it all comes together. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, if I recall correctly, um, you guys are actually, your technology has been involved in some pretty neat um, sort of uh, projects. Maybe, maybe talk to some of them. If I remember correctly, even uh, in the Great Lakes, you guys were looking for uh, was it the Avril Arrow or so? Exactly. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe talk to some of those neat stories. Yeah, I mean, about that uh, the story with the Avril Arrow. We had the Avril Arrow uh, prototypes. Uh, once they canceled the Avril Arrow uh, project, uh, I think it's now three years ago that we found them. But uh, they were launched into uh, Lake Ontario, and there was a, a group of investors that started a project um, that funded um, you know to go look for the, these Avril Arrow models. And uh, you know, we we found them uh, in Lake Ontario using our uh, our uh, our thunderfish. So it's, it was a little bit of great international uh, uh, recognition. That's for sure. Yeah, no, great, great old uh, Canadian technology <laughs> being found by new Canadian technology. That's great. Yeah. Um, uh, listen, I mean, we I think we've covered most of the questions we have here. So, Joel, uh, what we like to do at this point is just give you an opportunity to sort of. Um, you know, leave the audience with whatever key message or, or maybe even sort of what to expect over the next six to 12 months. Yeah. This is your opportunity to say whatever uh, you think you need to say. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I leave, leave the people with, you know, um, we think there's a huge opportunity for us to, in the military market. You really have to understand that it's old technology that's out there and there's just an opportunity. You know, this old technology is 25, 30 years old, 35 years old. Uh, it's obsolete. And we're sitting in a, in a great spot to upgrade a number of countries with our SaaS and our Catfish project product. And, you know, that's going to lead to multi-year sales um, over, you know, this will all play out through 2021 and it will continue, continue going. But I think if we can layer on top of that, accelerate that recurring revenue growth, um, take away some of the lumpiness that we you kind of have. If we don't sell a, a Catfish or a large battery order in a certain quarter, we have a you know, lower revenue. Um, and if we can accelerate that recurring revenue piece, take away that lumpiness, continue to you know, execute on the military market, I think, you know, we're going to have some impressive growth here for um, the next uh, the next number of years. So, I, so those of you listening, I, I really recommend that you take a look at some of the, the video and some of the presentations that uh, this company's put together. Um, most of it's on their website. Um, you're going to see some really neat technology here and, and really proud that we can showcase, uh, you know, phenomenal world-class Canadian technology here. Um, you know, little companies that are going up against some, some very large international companies. So Joe, um, what, uh, what is your website address? Uh, if somebody wants to get more information. Yep. Crackandrobotics.com. Simple as that. Perfect. Um, Joe, I want to thank you for spending time with us today and, and introducing your company to us. Um, and, and listen, we look forward to catching up with you, hopefully uh, in the future, uh, after some uh, more material progress. That's great, Paul. I appreciate your time. Appreciate your, uh, your uh, interest. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Guys, uh, we've been speaking with Joe McKay, uh, CFO of Kraken Robotics, symbol is PNG uh, on the Venture Exchange. Joe, once again, thanks. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Have a good night.